No, my heart of my Kelda Tato, welcome along to this uh, corridor nui to this big chat that we are having tonight. It is all about uh, pregnant people and the Pfizer vaccine. And I know it's something that new mums, pregnant mums, kind of everybody, Fano everywhere, have been talking about. So it's um, a great honour for me to be joined by these incredible experts in their field. They know all about the Pfizer vaccine. They know all about pregnant bodies and whare tangata and, and all that goes on there. So it's amazing to have them all with us tonight um, to pick their brains. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this and not for tuning in to um, Treasure Island. Um, if you're watching this after the fact, I really hope that Lance didn't win. I'll be really mad if he wins after all that. But anyway, um, thank you for being here with us right now. Um, I want to kick things off. I will get to our incredible panellists in just a moment, um, but I just want to uh, introduce myself. Ko kānoa loi Um I work at The Project, and I've just become a new mum. I've got a three-month-old upstairs who I'm really hoping will um, stay asleep, and if she does doesn't stay asleep. I'm really hoping she'll take a bottle because her dad's up there with her. Um, I made the decision to get double vaccinated um, about halfway through my pregnancy. And uh, like I know that when you're pregnant, especially for the first time, that it's so overwhelming about what you put into your body and what you do and am I doing the right thing? Um, so it's it's totally natural to have questions and concerns and 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 to be confused uh, given all the information that's out there. But like the day that I found out that there was a really low chance of me actually getting listeria from eating ham um, and I just started eating ham and cheese and it was very freeing and very, very wonderful for me. I hope that this court at all that this conversation um, can be really freeing and empowering for you too if you have any questions about this. So let's kick things off. Um, like I say, I'm really honoured to be joined by all these incredible people that are here with us on this live now. Um, I want to start with Michelle Wise. She's an obstetrician and gynaecologist based in Auckland, but if you detect a bit of an accent, she is from Canada. Um, as she knows a lot of things about a lot of things. So um, Michelle, can I come to you and just ask you first, um, why did you make the decision to get vaccinated? Sure. Well, being from Canada, I had a lot of my family members uh, get COVID infection last year during the first wave. And a lot of my colleagues who are healthcare workers, I just saw them working so hard and uh, doing everything they could to protect themselves and their own families from going to work every day and potentially being exposed. So as soon as we actually had a vaccine and a way of protecting ourselves from when we were at work, I, I jumped at that chance and it was both to protect myself, my own family and all of my patients. Amazing. Well, uh, big mahi to you for being here and looking forward to picking your brain a little bit more. Um, Kara Okisini Ngafa is also an obstetrician uh, based at uh, Middlemore. And Kara, you've got a really beautiful background. Cook Island, Samoan, Nguyen, Am I missing any of the islands out? You've got pretty much everything covered. Yeah, that's new way on the background there. It's oh, one beautiful. of the famous um, places called Limu where a lot of people internationally go there to, 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 um, to scuba dive. And so I know that at Middlemore you're looking after a lot of our um, Pacifica mama. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do and, uh, and why you chose to get vaccinated? I guess it was very interesting, though. Um, you know, when I when it started off, there was a lot of everybody was going about how this vaccine was really quite early, and there wasn't a lot of information about it. And it was interesting because we had, you know, a lot of us specific people. We do a lot of praying on a Sunday, so we had a fellowship. And I said to my children, "Oh, you know, I'm not going to get vaccinated." And then I saw on my phone that there were people, you know, my colleagues were saying there was extra vaccinations that were available. And in the next minute, you know, I just felt it was the right thing to do, you know, straight from a fellowship at church, just straight thinking, "Not right. I'm going to go and get this vaccine." So I came home. My children were going, "Mom, but you see, you're not going to get vaccinated." And I said, "No, I felt it was the right thing to do to protect my my the women I'm going to look after." And I just felt in my heart it was the right thing to do, so I did it. So yeah, that's why I got vaccinated, and you know, it protects also the patients I'm looking after. And, and it was like a light bulb moment. I thought. No, that's all right. Need to do. I'm going so I went and did it. So yeah, so protect family, whānau, you know, and everyone really. 
Cara, I love that you say that because I feel like I had the same sort of moment. Like I've said to, um, you know, other pregnant friends who were sort of on the fence as well. Like I feel like it was sort of a tipuna driven thing that uh, I, like I was not sure, not sure, not sure. And then like you, I sort of had this moment where I was like, no, I just know that this is the right thing to do. Uh, the research is there too. And I've, I'm talking to people that I trust. I talked to my obstetrician at the time, but I definitely think that there, there'll be a lot of people that just kind of need that tap on the shoulder, that tohu, that, that, that moment of clarity. So I thank you for speaking about that. And I look forward to talking to you more. Um, Chris is an incredible, Chris Mellon is an incredible midwife. You've got 20 years midwifery experience and um, I know you do a bit of work with Cara at Middlemore. Chris, why did you want to get vaccinated? Um, kia ora, thank you for that. Um, I think for me the same as what Cara said really. So I'm originally from the UK and so I saw we had, you know, get we got to see didn't we what was happening before it was sort of happening to us. Um, and also I've got family and my son's in Melbourne, so get to, got to see that as well. So um, it wasn't really an easy decision for me, really, because of seeing that. And I think by having it, I saw it as a really powerful tool that um, I could use with everything else we have to do with masks, washing our hands and social distancing um, to really protect my, you know, my loved ones, Fano, our community and our women and their babies, you know, coming to us and then our colleagues so that we could, it could be something that we could have to just keep us safe in this time because we've got enough to do without COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, as if you guys haven't got enough on, we've just got to throw this into the mix. Um, so Chris will be with us for the rest of this live and she's also the chair of the Midwifery Council of New Zealand. If you've got any questions that you think Chris is the person um, that you want to ask. And we've also got Bronwyn Robinson, uh, a nurse, and she's also an educator and advisor for the Immunisation Advisory Centre. Um, we were talking just before this and that kind of means, uh, Bronwyn, that you, you answer a lot of phone calls you answer a lot of freaked out people's questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what made you get vaccinated? Sure. So, kia ora koutou. Um, for me, I've been immersed in the vaccination and immunisation world um, probably for the last four years. Um, so, for me, it's more about, um, you know, helping prevent generations of New Zealanders experiencing severe disease specifically severe COVID disease. Um, you know, it's, I see it as being like our team partner did for us, um, you know, protecting us against diseases like polio and measles. Um, you know, I came from my nana telling me about you know, how horrific it was. So it was a really simple decision for me. Um, and luckily now I have the opportunity to help other people make that decision as well. Kapai. Well, it's awesome to have you all here for this chat tonight. So the idea, I mean, this is Facebook, we're on social media, and the idea is that if you are watching and you have any questions, um, you fire those through to us. We've got the Ministry of Health social team sitting there. Um, shout out to Sammy, who's going to be trying to fire through any questions that you do have. If they don't get answered during this session, there's lots of resources that you can look at, and, and we'll do our best to stay on top of those. Um, but I'm going to kick things off with a few kind of more general questions um so maybe um michelle i might come to you first um and ask this question of you um will the vaccine hurt our bubbers so what we do know is that every study that has researched this exact question has come out showing that the vaccine is safe to take during pregnancy and it's recommended that you take it at any stage during the pregnancy. So we know that uh, people who take it in the first trimester are not at added risk of miscarriage. Uh, we know that there's not problems with the baby being born with any abnormalities, so we don't see any other, other problems, for example, at that 18 to 20 week anatomy scan. Uh, we also know things like preeclampsia, diabetes, um, preterm birth, all those things uh, are the same in women who have had the vaccine and people who are pregnant who have not had the vaccine. So I think that's really reassuring to show that it's safe and it won't affect the baby. 
It's really interesting because in my first trimester, like if anybody tried to do anything to me full stop, I would have been like, no, I was lucky. I, I wasn't vomiting or anything, but I was just like, I didn't, I didn't want my husband to touch me. I just got annoyed looking at my colleagues. And so the idea of like going in somewhere, sitting down and getting that, that jab is a bit inconceivable to me, if I'm honest. Um, is there sort of any uh, great risk of going, actually, I'm just going to wait until I'm sort of standing on my, two, my own two feet and, and feel a bit more robust? Yeah, that's a great question. There's so many people that don't feel great in the first trimester. If people want to wait until they're feeling better, I think that's absolutely reasonable. I guess at that stage, you're kind of weighing up how much at risk are you of getting COVID infection? So if you're a healthcare worker, that's a bit different than if you're a writer and you spend most of your day indoors and have someone else that can go out to the grocery store for you. So I think you're just kind of judging your chances of being infected. You might also make sure that everybody else in your bubble is themselves vaccinated. So that's a, a, a way of protecting you as well. And then of course, all the usual uh, hand washing, social distance, face covering type of measures. Awesome. Hey, I know we're already underway, but as part of our introductions, I just wanted to acknowledge Donna, who's down there doing our New Zealand Sign Language, and you'll probably meet Scott later on as well. Um, hi, Donna. <laughs> um, so, okay, cool. So you're really comfy with it. Um, all the research is saying that it's not going to hurt your baby. Um, I can put my hand up and say that my baby is very happy and very healthy and she's she's eating a lot and she's gaining a lot of weight and all the normal things that you would want in a healthy baby. That's just one, just one story. But uh, you must all know uh, double vaxxed mums, do you, Cara? Have you met double vaxxed mums and, and happy, healthy babies? Um, I haven't met very many uh, double vax mums. The ones that I've met actually are the ones that are not vaccinated and are extremely unwell. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, through through your work, you've you've met people that have um, contracted COVID-19. What What's it like looking after a patient that's got COVID-19 and is also pregnant? Um, extremely scary. It's scary for them. It was scary for us in the beginning as well. Um, because when the COVID hit, say, for example, um, I think that plane landed on the Sunday. COVID was out in the community by the Tuesday, and we went into lockdown on that day. And so by the end of that week, the pregnant mums that were very unwell with COVID were starting to come in. And, um, and so, you know, we were, you know, everybody, it, it was such a shock because although we did have time to, we, we knew about the Delta variant overseas, we were brought reading up the materials about it, but we didn't expect it to hit our shores so quickly in New Zealand and people to become quickly very, very, you know, very fast, really, really that quickly, including pregnant mums. And so when, when you know, when our pregnant mums come in, we have a special ward that they go to, which is a respiratory ward, which is in Ward 7 on in Middlemore. Um, but, you know, um, so... In women's health, we're on, you know, we have a sort of separate area where we work um, in women's health. But so these women were going into a, a respiratory ward that's specifically set up for them. And um, our colleagues, you know, are not, are not, they don't look after pregnant women uh, on a regular basis like we do. So um, what you need to do is, because you see them all the time, you recognize the signs and the symptoms when they're unwell. And so if your colleagues who are not familiar and with respiratory clinicians who are not familiar with looking after pregnant women with COVID, who also may have other comorbidities, um, mm -hmm. may not sort of appreciate how unwell and how sick they are. And so you're, you're constantly, you know, trying to, you know, bring everybody up to speed very quickly. And one of the key things that was so important for us is communication between colleagues and also um, the evidence around the management of these women. And so you see what's happening. So, you know, if you look at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and all the information that they have in there, it basically, right in front of your eyes, you see, you know, someone who is extremely unwell. And everything that's written, like developing preeclampsia, being extremely unwell, low oxygen levels, struggling to breathe, 
um, the oxygen requirements just go up and up and up because they just their oxygen levels are just going down and down and they're they're really struggling, they're coughing, they've got high temperatures, and they're just so unwell, they can't even eat. Um, and that was one of the key things we sort of um, uh, realized at the time that these women, every time that they try to eat something, their oxygen levels just drop so low. Um, so you're juggling so many different things, including managing the other comorbidities as well. As well. And this is a mum and this is a baby. And you know that when the oxygen levels in the mum who's struggling really hard to breathe also affects the baby because you have less oxygen, less nutrition going to the baby. So that baby's also affected. And so you try, um, and so what you, you know, you, as an obstetrician, you're, the, what you fear the most is that if they're not monitored the way that you're familiar with. Um, and so we had to put in place very, very quickly what we call news charts, you know, so that these women are, you know, have hourly recordings and make absolutely sure you have to be extremely vigilant. And you also have to work um, in a very multidisciplinary. You have to tell lots of different people, you know, infectious diseases about the kind of medications that they're going to need that's been used overseas in, in other countries that's worked. You've got to try and get all your teams, um, you know, together, all your nieces, you need to let them know there is a likelihood this woman might need to be delivered early which, you know, and they do get delivered early. They get birthed early. It's really lonely. They have no far now. Nobody's allowed into the room. There are a lot of the time they're on their own. And so, therefore, they just on constantly on their on their um, iPad or their phone just trying to talk to their family because they're so scared. They're so unwell. And they're so lonely. And there's nobody there with them. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, even more so when you go to intensive care unit, you know, when you're in intensive care unit, you know, you, for us as obstetricians, we're a lot happier when they're there because they have that intensity of the monitoring that they do have, which is very different from when they're on on on, on ward seven, say for example. And so, and then and then as as things escalate as well, you know, they develop high blood pressure, they develop preeclampsia, and. And then you know that you're down on a slippery slide and you have to make decisions very quickly. And, and you do birth a baby quite early. Um, and, and often by cesarean section, especially if they develop preeclampsia, because you know that they're on a slippery slope and they can become very, very sick very fast. So, um, and for some, and yeah. Oh, sorry, Cara. I was just going to say, no offence to any of you and the wonderful work you do, but just everything you're describing sounds like you know, my nightmare as a pregnant person, because you just, you you don't want to be in a hospital. You want to keep the people around you to your familiar faces. You want your family to be there. Not just, not just the sort of medical scary concerns that you're talking about. And, and I do want to say to the audience that this is not about, um, you know, freaking you out about what could happen if you catch COVID. This is, you know, this is the reality that you could become very, 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 very ill. Um, it's not just the medical stuff. It's, yeah, it's all that psychological stuff of being lonely and being surrounded by strange faces. And, um, you know, Chris, I think you mentioned that that your colleagues that wear PPE, you know, all, all you're seeing is a pregnant mum who's got COVID is just like a little bit of somebody's eyes so I mean that does thank you Cara that does really put it in perspective about why we're here and why we're having this court at all because you know nobody should be should be being treated in hospital for this if they can avoid it but let alone someone who's got to think about bringing bringing a new person into the world um Chris the I do themselves also, uh, sorry uh, Kanoa the, no, the babies you. you know they go into intensive care neonatal intensive care unit and they're also alone because families oh. don't come in, yeah. Families don't come in, um, and so the baby's alone as well. Um, yeah, and there's not a single there's not a single parent in the world that is not you know wanting to do the right thing, the best thing, the the healthiest thing for themselves and for their family. And and so you know I understand why people would be um, you know on the fence or apprehensive. But but listening to what you're saying, it does not sound like. Anything like a good I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on any pregnant woman. It's not mm. worth it. Mm. It's better to be vaccinated and stay safe and be protected and stay well. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll come to you, Chris, and ask this one. Is there um, a safer 
Oh, actually, sorry, we've kind of checked that off with um, Michelle. Um, can I ask you this one? My midwife told me not to have the vaccine as it could have long-term effects on my baby. I'm afraid about this and I find myself in a difficult spot. What are your thoughts? Right, great question. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I think like exactly like what you were saying, Kate, is about that women are, you know, or pregnant people, they're, one of the things they do when you become pregnant is you become really, you know, um, concerned about different things and thinking about what you should eat, what you shouldn't do. And that's really important. And that's part of being pregnant is actually protecting yourself. And, and, and that's why I can understand, like you were saying, some people might be apprehensive about thinking about this because that's right. They should be thinking about it and looking at the research and seeing if it is safe for them and their baby. So as, um, and if that did happen, if a, if a midwife did say that to um, one of her clients and the, I think if, say the woman had asked me, I would say that actually the, the research tells us that it is safe for you and your baby. We know that by huge studies across the world um, that have been done in huge numbers, much bigger numbers than we have that we have in New Zealand that have shown that it is perfectly safe for you and your baby. So if a, if a mother became in that position, um, she could go back to her midwife and just say, I'm not sure, can I have a bit more information, please? Or okay, tell me why that is, maybe just try and understand that a little bit. So, or go to another health practitioner. So she could go to a GP and ask her GP or, um, or a whānau member who may be a health practitioner or may have had the vaccine and is, you know, knows that it was actually okay and has got the information and can explain it to her so she feels that she feels safe to have it when she's got that information. So, and I, and I think it is, like Kara said, it is really scary, yeah, for our mums, it is coming through into the system. So, but I think I think one thing that we try to, and as, as the midwives like we've tried to really do at counties in our community and at our hospital is really remember, this is actually a really special time so pregnancy <laughs> and birth and having your baby is something that's really important and that baby's going to have, this is their birthday for the rest of their life. Mm. So much more important to have that as their birthday and had your vaccine rather than it being impacted by COVID. And every year they'll remember that. <laughs> so I think just like that's what I would just say is really, um, yeah, it's been an interesting time. Um, and I think hard for a woman exactly like Cara said. So um, they're coming in, they're nervous anyway um, about having a baby anyway. They may be wherever they're having baby. So um, I think our role is just really reassuring them. And one thing I was going to say is that we really, really want you to get vaccinated. 100% we do because we know what the impact is of it. But uh, if you don't, we will still care for you. We will still give you good care. You still will be looked after um, we'll ask you lots of questions so that we can keep you and your whanau safe <laughs> and so that we can care for you in different ways in PPE and lots of other things. But we still will care for you. So don't be scared that you're not going to and um, not, you know, not get cared for because we still have to care for you. It's really important. Yeah, kia ora Chris, thank you for saying that because it is really important and I, you know, I'm with you, I don't want anyone to feel isolated because of the decision that they that they have made. I do, so your advice, if um, if your midwife is saying don't do it, your advice is essentially, um, you know, look to those sort of trusted resources and maybe ask another medical professional who you trust, who you can get support from. And and just to clarify that, you know, the New Zealand um, midwives, your, your yeah. the New Zealand College of Midwives, your position is um, this is absolutely safe, even if there are sort of people that maybe have a different idea. Yeah, and the midwifery council is the same, the regulatory, be same as the medical and nursing council. We're all on the same page on this. So, yeah. I mean, and you could, she could go back to her midwife and that she's with and just say, explain to me why you're saying it's, you know, because maybe the midwife didn't as, yeah, is just is scared too. And maybe they have to need to have a discussion about it and get some more information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Hey, um, thank you so much to people who are sending through questions on uh, Facebook. I'm getting a few of those fired through now. Um, I thought maybe I could come to you, Bronwyn, and ask on behalf, uh, behalf of Ruth, um, if you had the vaccine while you're breastfeeding, does your baby get any of the vaccine? No, so the studies show that um, none of the mRNA comes through in the breast milk, um, but they do, however, get antibodies, which is a great benefit. So we know that they get great antibodies um, through the placenta while they're pregnant, but they also get those carried through in the breast milk as well. So we know breast milk is a medicine, you know, it contains all of those great things. So all of the um, antibodies uh, from different 
you know, colds, coughs, flus that mum's had in the past, she's got those antibodies and they're going through and the same thing with the vaccine. So the MRA br um, breaks down so fast that um, there's no way it would make it there, um, but those antibodies linger. Um, so it's really been beneficial to, to baby for having breast milk after the vaccine. It coats the inside of their mouth and their throat. Um, so that's how it helps protect them. Um, it does get breaking, broken down after that. Um, so ideally during pregnancy gives you the, the best coverage, but yes, definitely with breast milk. Yay, I'm so happy to hear that. I'll make sure I tell my daughter when I go back and see her soon. Um, we've also got, uh, well, we've got a couple of questions about um, how the vaccine sort of works and reacts with uh, other conditions that pregnant people might be um, experiencing. Um, Tony Allen wants to know, does extreme low iron and low haemoglobin levels have any effect on how the vaccine works? Um, uh, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Michelle, I choose you. Mm -hmm. So is the question that if somebody was diagnosed with anemia where they had a low blood count or low iron, if they could still get the vaccine, if there would be an interaction? Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of anything in that regard. I think um, it's really important to still increase your iron levels and take iron if that's been prescribed to you by your midwife. And I don't think that's a reason to delay getting the vaccine or to not get it at all. Okay, awesome. Um, Kendra wants to know if there are any implications for women with PCOS with polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, I'm not sure whether she's talking about uh, women with PCOS who are pregnant or not, but um, I wonder, um, Cara, do you know anything about PCOS and, um, and the vaccine? I think Michelle will be better at answering that. <laughs> oh, Michelle. Do I do? Yeah. She does all the PCOS I think, stuff. Um, I think where that person's coming from is that uh, PCOS is a gynecology condition that you can be diagnosed with if your menstrual cycles are irregular. And initially, when people first started getting vaccinated in the States, there was one or two people who took to social media to say that their menstrual cycle the following month after getting the jab had come a bit late or come a bit early or it was a bit heavier, a bit lighter, a bit longer, a bit shorter, um, and just sort of wondering if it was related to the jab. So I think people who um, have already some kind of condition that makes their cycles irregular might understandably be nervous that there would be an effect of the jab on their menstrual cycle. Um, that is currently being researched in a much better way through a couple different registries in different countries. Uh, but we literally, I had just written an article on this and I went back to my own menstrual cycle um, app on my phone. I was like, I think my, my own menses has been delayed. It was so funny, um, but it came right the following month. And I think that a lot of things affect a single menstrual cycle. If you're a bit stressed, I can imagine the stress levels um, over the last year and a half. I can imagine people, some people being really relieved, suddenly a reduction in stress with getting the jab, whilst other people really worried about side effects or whatever. So I can see how just lots of things in, you know, impact on sleep, impact on what you're eating could affect a single menstrual cycle so I think what we've tried to reassure people is that it's probably fine but if things do persist that they can speak to their GP or their healthcare professional yeah I mean I because I have definitely seen um that corridor out there about oh I think uh, you know something's happened so um I'm really relieved to know that there's there's ongoing research and that also it's kind of a normal thing to be concerned about like if you Dr Michelle Wise obstetrician are also freaking out or not freaking out but you know kind of doing a double take about it because I think that's the other thing is that you know as as a pregnant person or a person who's menstruating or whatever you always have you know you've got so much information coming in and you've always got stresses and concerns that that impact you so yeah it's nice I to can know. add a little bit there um, go Bronwyn just to um, let everyone know that that is also something that has occurred with other immunizations. So it's not new to us. Um, mm. It was witnessed with the HPV vaccine. So it's likely more to do with their immune response. And as Michelle said, when your body is under stress, that's when stuff starts to go wrong. So I think it's reassuring to know that that's not something new, particularly with the COVID vaccine. Fascinating. That is really good. Um, I'm just having a look at some of these questions coming through on Facebook and please do keep them coming. Um, 
Oh, Lauren wanted to know, um, and this might be for you, Chris, or you, Cara, um, how many babies were born early due to COVID in mum. So, so your, your patients that you're seeing who have got COVID, um, are they having their babies earlier than planned? Um, Cara, do you want to talk to that? I mean, we have had, yes, some babies of women that weren't vaccinated were born early. Yes, we have definitely at counties, yeah. And, and why is that happening? Can you? I know you sort of touched on it a little bit before, but um, just for uh, just for Lauren, can you explain a little bit about what might be happening there? Uh, yep, yeah. Cara or Michelle, do you want to talk to that? I mean, there's seven times more aren't they, of having their babies early. A lot of that is because of the actual how they de- how they're dealing with actually COVID and that um, deteriorating, um, and that's why they're needing to be delivered earlier. Um, so that we can actually help the mother and um, deliver baby because mother's getting less oxygen, which is not great for baby either. So, Michelle and Cara, that's what you you, you would make yeah, can I Can I clarify the question, please? There's a question about women who are not vaccinated and are having their babies early. Is that what, you're, mm. what the question is? The question, I'll read it for you verbatim and then I'll, I'll leave it to you. How many babies were born early due to COVID in mum? So I think it's about, um, you know, patients that you're seeing in hospital that have COVID and what that means for their baby. So the ones that tend to be to birth early are the ones that are extremely unwell. And so the reasons why they're birthed early is because we have to make the mum better. Um, But we haven't had that many um, women with COVID that have birthed their babies that early because most of the ones that have come tend to be quite late in pregnancy. And even the ones that come early, we try to make them better and then let them go home as well. So that's what that's been our experience is that they they might be admitted to hospital because they require a bit more care and then when they're better. So we don't encourage... um, being for, for women to be birthed early, if we can prevent it, then yes. But the ones that we've had to birth early is because we the mums are so, so unwell that we had to birth the baby uh, so that we can make mum better as well. So it was quite a, a difficult balance. You know, you've got to balance the mum and the baby's health as well. So you, you're constantly juggling two people. Yeah, and so that's been our experience as well. And, it's why, and, and also the same overseas as well. But Michelle's got her hand up. <laughs> I was I was just going to add that um, in New Zealand, we have such small numbers, thankfully, uh, as we've had throughout the pandemic compared to other countries. So the most recent thing I just read um, showed that about 50% of women who got COVID during their pregnancy birthed early. And just to put that in perspective, the usual rate is around 8%. And that's been really consistent year over year, decade over decade. So that's a huge number of uh, mums birthing early and a lot of babies going to the nursery. Yeah, and nobody nobody wants that at all. Um, Leah has a question from Facebook. Thank you, Leah. Um, where can I find studies that are saying it's safe for pregnancy? And I think this is a fantastic question because it, it, like, it's so hard to sort the wheat from the chaff. Um, maybe I will come to you, Bronwyn. Um, what, do, what do you recommend? Sure. So um, actually on our website, we've got, tons of information on there and there's actually a fact sheet about pregnancy and lactating um, and the COVID vaccine. Um, It also includes references so you can actually go and have a look at the articles that are referenced to find that information and I'm sure the information on the Ministry of Health and Things um, is the same so all our information is is referenced. Um, I have some great articles which um, I'm more than happy to send through um, I can't give you a link because they're um, obviously paid for, um, but I'm happy um, to pass on any info so I can um, organise that, post this. But those would be, those reputable sources would be the place places that you'd go to look for it. So we're talking um, Unite Against COVID website, New Zealand College of Midwives website, Um, they're a good place to start anyhow, right? And then you've kind of got jumping off points from there. And I'll just jump in with a plug for um, the New Zealand Doctors Stand Up for Vaccination. That site has just been updated today with a whole bunch of the whole section on pregnancy and the vaccine. 
Amazing. Awesome. Thank you very much for that question as well. Um, uh, Michaela, I hope I'm saying your name right, um, wants to know, can you please clarify that no constituents of the vaccine cross the placenta? I don't know what a constituent is, but I hope one of you experts do. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go to you, Cara. Do you know what a constituent is? No, I actually don't know what a constituent is. I'm not quite clear, sure what the question means, to be really honest. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if they mean excipient. Yeah, that's what Maybe. I mean. mm. um, so what that's that, the sorry, an excipient, so the, the ingredients, essentially, of the vaccine. Got you. Um, because this vaccine is so basic, it only has the mRNA, so that's your active ingredient, and then you've just got fats, sugars, and salts. So they're really, really easy um, to see whether or not the mRNA goes through. They can test it in the breast milk. The other excipients are found naturally in your body other than the polyethyl glycol, which is a man-made lipid or fat, um, and that's found readily in lots of things like cosmetics, um, some foods unfortunately um, and you know lots of day-to-day -day products that, that we use um, but all the all those other ingredients are naturally found um, so we know that we're only looking for the active ingredient which is the mRNA and that's easy to trace. And I, I think the the main question is is that those those things that you're talking about those ingredients they're not crossing the placenta there's no evidence to say that that's been happening. No, and, and as I said, they're all natural. So even if they did cross the placenta, it's not going to be any, not going to cause any harm. Um, and the mRNA breaks down so quickly, um, it just isn't found in there. Awesome. Does anybody else have any thoughts on, on that, Chris? I could see you nodding away there. Are you just being encouraging or do you want to add? I've always been encouraging. That's good. But, um, yeah. <laughs> No, I was just yeah saying what Bronwyn yeah is that's exactly right. Good, it's um yeah it's not an issue in relation to that, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say um sometimes when we're answering those types of questions in antenatal clinic, um people had heard that there was I think there was a blog back in December, um initially when the Pfizer vaccine first came out that there was something about the mRNA being able to um can like it was a it was um, one of the proteins, the spike protein was a similar one to a placental one. They were worried about an interaction with the placenta and that's where all these um, ideas around possibly impacting fertility and early pregnancy, et cetera, came from. So um, that was a really important thing to research. And some of those studies were done early this year showing absolutely that that protein, although theoretically similar, was not actually similar enough. So we don't have, um, we don't see the vaccine or any of its things in the placentas that we study. Um, and with respect to fertility, I don't know if that has come up as a question, but, you know, they even studied the vaccine in, in couples undergoing IVF, and they didn't see any change to the couples, uh, both the women and the men were tested for all kinds of parameters for the women, it was their eggs and for the men, it was their sperm and they looked at the embryos and they really studied this at a very microscopic, tiny level and seen absolutely no differences in people who have had the vaccine compared to those who haven't. Yeah, amazing. I, I have heard that the things being the same, that study that you're talking about, Michelle. So thank you. I'm glad you've got your finger on the pulse with those things. Um, because, yeah, again, there's so much information swirling around there. So thank you, everyone, who's kind of breaking that down into questions and to you guys for um, being able to bust some of those myths. Um, another one of those I guess, uh, you know, concerns that a lot of people have had is uh, how come uh, the vaccine is considered safe for my unborn baby, but it's not yet recommended for children? Does anyone want to speak about that? I choose you, Bronwyn. I can <laughs> see you there. Um, sure. So it's not at all that it's unsafe for our children um, because um, our 12-year-olds and up we class as an adult size, so they can have adult doses of medications and things in most cases. Um, but our children, we need to work out and calculate what sort of dose 
they can have and how effective that dose is. So we needed more information and they are vaccinating children overseas and we're now gathering that information. So it's not going to be long and we will be vaccinating our children, um, but we're quite lucky to be at the bottom of the world and a bit behind with um, our rollout because we get to gather all that information from around the world. Um, and it all looks extremely positive. In fact, the five to 11 year olds, some of the efficacy is, which is how well the vaccine works, is up around 100%, which is amazing. Um, so it's not at all that it's um, not safe. It's yeah, just making sure that we get the right amount for, for our little babies. Wow, that's so good to know. And also, is, is anything 100% effective? That's incredible. <laughs> Um, okay, here's another sort of spicy one, or actually it goes a little bit to what you were talking about, Bronwyn, with just getting that the more information for the 5 to 11-year-olds. Um, someone here thought that clinical trials for pregnant people only started in February this year. Um, I don't know anything about that, but, um, but their question is, how do you know it's safe if, it, if we've only been doing these studies since February? Um, does anyone, Michelle, I can see you nodding there. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So um, those studies are uh, are being referenced to are the ones out of the United States. It's the V-Safe registry. And basically, every time they um, offered somebody a vaccine, they asked if they were pregnant and they, um, with consent, obviously, they asked for permission to ask the question. They answered it and people who wanted to were then followed up. So the initial um, cohort of people that they reported on, it was about 800 pregnant women. And that was reported in about May because the majority of those people who were pregnant were already in their third trimester and have had the baby. The follow-up update was published last month uh, with um, about three and a half thousand women from off the top of my head. Uh, and again, it showed um, that all the rates of all the usual pregnancy conditions that we see more commonly, such as preeclampsia, diabetes, um, uh, growth restriction in babies who just aren't growing to their full potential, uh, preterm birth, none of these things were uh, higher than the reported background risk for, for, that, um, for that area. So I think that was that's quite reassuring and those are the best studies we have. I think what the question also reflects is that the initial Pfizer studies were done on non-pregnant adults because just if you look back through history, pregnant women are often excluded from research. And that's just a much bigger issue than we can cover in this call. But that is just unfortunately the best thing we've got. Yeah, but then also kind of understandable because I don't know if when I was pregnant, I would have been like, hey, test a thing on me, go for it. Exactly. Um, so you want to see first that it's safe in non-pregnant adults before you launch into a, a pregnancy study. So now Pfizer is doing a randomized control trial, like that best top quality study that you can do in pregnant women that started I think around three months ago. So that will report next year. Um, but there are these registry studies, like there's another one in Ontario that's covered every woman who's given birth um, in 2021. And they've also reported um, absolute safety. And that's in tens of thousands of women, um, not just the few thousand that we see in the American study. So lots of reassuring data out of the UK as well. This is just a random question that's popped into my head, Chris. Um, but when I, part of my thinking when I got my vaccinations was I want to do it now while I'm pregnant in case I experience any side effects like getting a bit fluey um, because I'd rather have those and, and deal with those when I'm pregnant rather than, um, you know, like when I've got a newborn and I haven't slept. And I'm glad because uh, to, after my second one, I actually did have a headache for half a day and I think about that with my daughter now and I would not want to deal with that. That story is to ask you the question, um, would you recommend that um, mums sort of work with their midwives, maybe get set up to get some support in case they do have a day of being fluey? Like, is it a good idea to kind of get vaccinated whilst pregnant in collaboration with your, with your primary health person? Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, if you can do it in the pregnancy at any time is the best time to do it, yes. Um, but if you haven't managed to do that, doing it afterwards, yes, is fine as well. And probably, yeah, a good idea because there, there will be like normal things that you have. Sometimes there's a bit of feeling a bit like the flu, a bit of a sore arm and a bit of a headache. And they're usually really short 
um, period of time, so 24, 48 hours. So yes, if you can get somebody to be around just at that time to support you so that you can um, deal with that, that's probably a good idea. So, um, but to be um, really, it's probably if you can, then do it in your pregnancy, like you said, because then you're done, aren't you, and all dusted, and then you can deal with, with a new baby, which is really exciting and lots of other things to deal with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I'm so, I, I feel really grateful that I got it before um, Delta landed on our shores. I, I really feel for people that are having to make mm. this decision in a way more risky environment and, and, you know, having to line up for a lot longer and stuff too. So, you know, yeah. I know it's, I know it's not easy. Um, Lashan wants to know if uh, you guys know of any pregnant women who have had their oh had their jab in their third trimester and had any side effects. I think we've talked about this a little bit earlier on in the convo, but there are going to be people that are um, just jumping on. So, um, uh, Cara, do you know of any pregnant women who have had their jab in the third trimester and had any side effects? Um, most of the side effects, like Chris was just saying before, they're very mild. They might, most of them is mostly you know, having a sore arm. I feel a bit of fluid, a bit of headache. You drink lots of fluid, rest, and then it goes away after 24 to 48 hours. So any major side effects that people worry about, I you know that's extreme. It, it hasn't been reported as such as, you know, as significant. But um, it's, it's way different, you know, if you get the virus, that's, you know, that's when you're really... Uh, like one of the um, you know, those professors that comes on the news, I think it's Professor Jackson, he often says that, you know, there's two ways to be vaccinated, either voluntary or involuntary. And it's so much better to have voluntary and have a vaccination that's involuntary by the by the COVID, which is worse, you know. You'll, and, and, and the side effects that you get from just having the job is just very mild and they do go away. Um, and then you're, you know, just, uh, like, just like how you would have, you know, some women in, in pregnancy women, they know they do have the pertussis vaccination and they do have the flu vaccines, mm-hmm. you know, and those kind of mild side effects is very similar to what they would get if they have a COVID vaccination. You know. In your um, professional doctor opinion, Cara, like I know that, it, like, would you recommend like chocolate or ice cream for dealing with those side effects? hot bath, a massage from your partner? Um. Um, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably recommend a more healthy diet. And I know. I was going to say, and, you're a gestational diet. And some diabetes. more vegetables. <laughs> and, and just don't eat those chocolate and get rid of those fizzy drinks. They're not good for you anyway, whether you're <laughs> pregnant or not pregnant. So I wouldn't recommend an unhealthy diet. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Um, Chris, I know you had your hand up there um, talking about side effects. What What are you yeah. reckon? So, yeah, and exactly like what Cara said, they haven't, we haven't seen, and just where we are, haven't seen that. But that's why you stay afterwards when you've had your vaccine for those 20 minutes, just to be by the health practitioners watching to make sure you're okay, to have if there is any um, reactions that could happen in that time frame. And you do get lots of information when you come to, to say, this is what you should expect if you've got any concerns come back or contact anybody so um and and like you were saying yes not the unhealthy food cara sorry we can't say that but maybe the massage would be good to say (laughs) yes book and vaccine appointment and massage from partner thank you very much Um, and i definitely (laughs) and i can also recommend taking a really good book for that 15 or 20 minutes after you wait because it feels like a really long time um okay let's get back into some questions that are coming through on facebook um let me just have a look thank you i can actually i don't know if anyone can hear but i can hear my baby crying upstairs and it's kind of making my brain go a little bit fuzzy but um (laughs) my husband is on the case and i am looking through your questions oh this is an interesting one um cat wants to know cat is pregnant with twins congratulations cat um is the vaccine safe for multiple pregnancies and is there any um specific research on this is this something that one of you guys know about multiples I'm looking for hands. Oh, Cara, you've moved. Do you know about this? Um, as far as I'm aware that, uh, I mean, Michelle can correct me on this, it's, it's, it, it's safe in women with multiple pregnancies. It's very, very safe. Just like a woman with singleton pregnancy, it's very safe for a woman who's got multiple pregnancy, twins or even triplets, I suppose. So very safe, yes. 
That's so good because I feel like everything, like all the literature and kind of mommy blogs and stuff that I was reading when I was pregnant, everything was just that bit harder for for parents of multiples. So I'm yeah. glad that that the jam yeah. is. And the best thing, I mean, it's been you know all over the the research and all over the evidence that's shown that antibodies, you know, um, are transferred from the mum you know, through the placenta to the baby and it protects the baby and it's the safest thing to do. It's great. I think it's wonderful. Would the twins, like, fight in there for the antibodies? Is there enough antibodies to go around? <laughs> oh, they, they, they fight anyway, so no matter what you do. <laughs> um, Kara, can I ask you, is there, is there any ethnicity that is more at risk than any other? No, not that we're aware of. Okay. Oh, um, oh, are you talking about now? Now, this is a tricky question because ethnicity is often associated with social economic status. So, um, and that's a tricky question because, you know, it's more around the social economic status where they're, they're putting them as an at risk group, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it's because there are some ethnic groups that are in that group. And that's why we're sort of mixing the two. Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? I do know um, what you so, mean. So, so when you're asking a question about a, 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 a certain group, but that's because a certain group might be lower socioeconomic, high risks of obesity, high risks of diabetes, high risk of cardiovascular diseases. And we know that in these groups, that if they get the COVID, they're at more at risk of becoming more unwell. And that's because of that. Um, so yeah, so 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 the issue around ethnicity is a tricky one because mm. there are so many social determinants of health. That's that's more the probably the factors rather than ethnicity as such. So yeah, so I, I'm I'm often very careful in answering that kind of question. <laughs> yeah, no, good for you. But I think what, what we're saying here is that if you lined up um, a pregnant Pakistani woman, Samoan woman, um, Canadian Pakia woman who was fit and healthy, their the outcome would be no different than... Papai, all good. <laughs> no difference. Yeah, okay, <laughs> awesome. Um can I um, just, oh, we're going to start to wrap up. So now I'm getting a note that we're going to start to wrap up. I'm so deep in this convo. I have no idea what the time is. But um, before we go, um, I just guess I'd like to ask you all if you've got um, one last message for the people that have joined us for this live and, and that are still thinking about what they're going to do. So, Chris, maybe I'll start with you. Okay. So um, I think... One thing I'd say, and we're probably a little bit biased because we're in Auckland with the lockdown. <laughs> so um, COVID has taken many things away from us. Um, and we could say that about, lot, you know, for us over the last couple of months, why it's been with us. So this is one thing that you can kick COVID into touch, get your vaccination, and then you can actually um, celebrate your baby um, and the pregnancy and have it as a special time, which it should be, rather than, like I said before, letting the impact of COVID take that away from you. So um, that's what I would say, just don't let COVID take your, this beautiful time of having your baby and um, celebrating that. So get the vaccine and then you can still celebrate that special time, which is really important. Yeah, that's such that's such beautiful corridor, Chris, because as a new mum who's like desperate to show off my baby to my friends and my family and I, I can't, I'm just kind of holding her at a two metre distance on a picnic rug. It's not as good. It's definitely not as good. Um, Bronwyn, you have been living and breathing um, all of this stuff for a long time now. What's your message to um, to Aotearoa and to the, the hundreds of people that are online at the moment um, watching? Um, I think it's really just to think about everybody. You know, think of it as a collective effort. Um, Individually, yes, we want to protect ourselves and we absolutely want to protect our baby. Um, So if you're thinking about, um, you know, how you're going to do that, it's not just about you getting vaccinated while you're pregnant to protect baby for a short time. You want to look at it the same as you would with pertussis or the whooping cough, you know. Make sure everyone around you is also vaccinated and you create this community effort um, to help protect those who can't be vaccinated. So 
um, I just say get out there, get vaccinated and help protect everybody. Amazing. Um, Cara, what's your message for everyone? Um, you know, us women, we are very much aroha. You know, we love, we love, we love people. We love our families. We love our children. We, we often put ourselves last. And mm. um, but I think it's really important that you get vaccinated so that you can, you know, protect your, 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 your baby um, or your pipi. Um, and, and, and your family around you as well. And, and I think it's, yeah. And, and for a lot of Pacific women, I know that you're really scared, but, you know, don't be scared, you know, um, it's, it's safe. And, but even if you, if, if you get vaccinated, you'll come in, you know, yeah, that's great. But even if you are not vaccinated and you get COVID, we still would look after you, you know, just like anybody else. Um, we'll care for you. We'll, give you the best care that you can in the best experience you can, you know, given the circumstances. So don't be afraid. Um, but we'd prefer you to be vaccinated so you don't end up coming sick to us. Yeah, that's my message. And um, and we love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're really nice, Cara, but I'd really like to not see you when I was about to have my baby. <laughs> um, I'd love to but- see you, you know come in have your baby under normal circumstances and not not with COVID but even if you do we still aroha you and look mm. after you and care for you yeah <laughs> um Michelle you've been thinking about all of this stuff a lot what's your um, main thing that you want people to take away from tonight's kōrero I remember when I was pregnant, like it was yesterday, and I know that every single pregnant person wants to do what's best for themselves and their baby for the safest pregnancy. This is one of the vaccines that we know more about and has been tested in more people like than anything else in history. So I really feel strongly that this is 100% clear. Um, This is the right thing to do. It is the right time to do it. Uh, Your moment is now. Just get the jab. Beautiful. Well, look, I feel incredibly honoured to have gotten to spend a bit of time with you all. Thank you uh, for the work that you do, COVID or not. um, You're all incredible heroes. And thank you for lending your your, your brains and your hearts to this really important kaupapa. Um, If anybody still has questions, thank you so much for them all coming through. And I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to get to all of them, but you're actually in the right place already. Um, You'll be able to find really, really fantastic information here on the Unite Against COVID um, Facebook page and then there's also the New Zealand College of Midwives. Um, What's your one again, Michelle? Doctors Against? Yeah, New Zealand Doctors Stand Up for Vaccination. Yeah, choice. Um, Ngā mihi nui kia koutou. Um, Good luck if you're pregnant. All the best. Um, And if you're like me and you're a new mum and your baby's been crying upstairs, then run, go, go, go to them now. Um, Thank you all for this kōrero and um, good night.